Welcome to Math 1508 Pre-Calculus at the University of Texas El Paso. This lecture accompanies Larson's 10th edition of Pre-Calculus, Chapter 1, Functions and Their Graphs, Section 1.5, Analyzing Graphs of Functions. Let's take a look. So let's look at examples of domain and range. In our first graph in blue, our domain is going to be all possible x values. And as I check the x values, I work from left to right. And the first x value I encounter is negative 2. As I continue moving to the right, it looks like the last x value I use is 5. Notice the open circle on 5, so I use a parenthesis, whereas a closed circle says I do get to negative 2, so I use a bracket. For the range, I want to evaluate the y values from bottom to top. So as I am coming up the y-axis, it looks like I was trying to hit negative 3, and it looks like it was trying to go all the way up to positive 3. So negative 3 has the bracket, positive 3 has an open parenthesis because I never actually hit it. The graph in green, the graph labeled B. Domain, x values, negative 2 is the first one, and it keeps going forever, so to infinity. You could use inequality notation, x is greater than or equal to negative 2 instead. For the range values, notice that this keeps widening. So it's going to go forever down, it's going to go forever up. My range is negative infinity to positive infinity. Graph C, it widens to the right, it widens to the left. I'll end up using all of my x values from negative infinity to positive infinity. And my range, as I start from bottom to top, it looks like I was trying to hit negative 4 as my lowest value. We're going to go with approximately negative 4 and then continuing to positive infinity. We don't have to put the positive sign for positive infinity, but we do have to remember that it's parentheses, whereas we hit negative 4, so we'll use the square brackets. The vertical line test is a great way to determine if a graph is the graph of a function. A set of points in the coordinate plane is the graph of y as a function of x if and only if no vertical line intersects the graph at more than one point. These are all, assuming clarity of graph, these are all functions. Uh, if I were to take any vertical line, we're going to assume that's, that's coming out. You have to assume a lot when I'm sketching these, I'm just saying. Pretty much any vertical line I could put up here is only going to hit the graph once. Any vertical line I hit going to hit the graph at most once. Look, this vertical line doesn't hit the graph at all, but at never at more than one point. Every vertical line only hits the graph at one time. These three graphs all pass the vertical line test. They are all graphs of a function. Zeros of a function. Now we've talked about zeros a couple of times. A couple of times we talked about x-intercepts. Uh, we talked about zeros, I believe, in section 1.4 lecture as well. The zeros of a function f of x are the x values for which f of x equals zero. We also call the zeros roots and x-intercepts. Be able to switch in between these three terms continuously. We use the term zeros because the output is zero. x-intercepts because the y value is zero and it's on the x-intercept. And roots because the x-axis acts as the ground level and the roots uh, keep the function in place. So let's find the zeros of the function algebraically. To find the zeros of the function, I'm going to let f of x be 0 and solve for x. 3x squared plus 22x minus 16. I'm not really in the mood to factor that. And I could factor it, but I could also use the quadratic formula. The quadratic formula negative b, so negative 22, plus or minus the square root of the entirety, the discriminant. 22 squared minus 4 times 3 times negative 16, that's b squared, minus 4ac, all over 2 times 3, and that's 2 times a. Simplify the radicand first, 676. Uh, negative 22, a positive 6 in the denominator. The square root of 676, to my surprise, is a nice numbers, 26. This tells me, because there's no radicals left over, uh, that I could have factored, but quadratic formula works as well. So I simplify and I take it in two steps. I take x equals negative 22 plus 26 all over 6. Numerator first, that's 4 thirds, or excuse me, 4 sixths, which simplifies to 2 thirds. And then I take negative 22 minus 26 all over 6. 
That's a negative 48 over 6, which simplifies to be negative 8. My zeros. Zeros assume the y value is 0. I found my x values. 2 thirds comma 0 and negative 8 comma 0. If f of x equals x squared minus 9x plus 14 all over 4x. When I set this equal to 0, remember that's just the numerator equals 0 because my first step is multiply both sides by that denominator. If x squared minus 9x plus 14 equals 0, I ask myself, what two numbers multiply to be 14? Have the same sign and add to be negative 9x. That is x minus 7 times x minus 2. Zero factor property says if I multiply two things to get zero, the first one is zero or the second one is zero. So if x minus 7 equals zero, x equals 7. If x minus 2 equals zero, x equals 2. And so I'll have the point 7 comma 0 or the point 2 comma 0. Both are zeros of our function. Example 3, replace f of x with zero. If zero equals the square root of 3x plus 2, we could square both sides. When we square zero, we get zero. When we square a square root, we get the radicand, 3x plus 2. If 0 equals 3x plus 2, I can subtract 2, divide by 3, and I have my 0. Negative 2 thirds, comma 0 is the point, or we might say uh, the 0 of the function occurs at x equals negative 2 thirds. Increasing, decreasing, and constant functions. So a function is increasing on an interval. If for any x1 and x2 in the interval, it implies that f of x1 is less than f of x2. Now let's just kind of move this out of the way a little bit and draw. So if I have any x1 less than x2, then f of x1 is lower than f of x2 my graph is increasing. A function is decreasing if for any x1 that is less than x2, and they don't have to be in the first quadrant, it doesn't have to be positive x values, just any x1 less than x2. f of x1 is bigger than f of x2, then my function is decreasing in that interval. A function is constant on an interval if for any x1 and x2 in the interval, the function values are equal. So constant has equal y values. A relative minimum is a function value f of a. Uh, if there exists an interval x1 to x2 that contains a, such that f of a is the smallest value of any of the function values on that particular interval. A function value f of a is called a relative maximum of f if there exists an interval from x1 to x2 that contains a, such that for any x value in the interval, f of a is the largest or equal to the largest of any of the y values. Let's take a look at what this actually means. Near a here, uh, f of a is the lowest point. Now over here, f of a, or excuse me, f of x gets lower, but near here, in the neighborhood, this a value has the lowest y value associated with it. Whereas a relative maximum, here's an a value, and near it, in this area, right, in this interval of x values, f of a is the highest point. The graph gets higher somewhere else, but near here, relatively close to a, this is a maximum. There may be other higher points, but they are not near enough to x equals a. Here's an example. Uh, just some standard function f. Uh, here's a, which is a relative maximum, and here's b, which gives us a relative minimum. From negative infinity to a, my graph is increasing. It's going up from left to right. From a to b, my graph is decreasing. It's going down from left to right. And from b to positive infinity, x values, my graph is going up. So the function shows us what's happening, but we report just the domain values, just the x values. Uh, increasing, therefore, from negative infinity to a and from b to infinity, and decreasing in between, between a and b. Average rate of change. For a nonlinear graph, 
whose slope changes at each point. The average rate of change between any two points is the slope of the line through the two points. This is known as the slope of the secant line. Now, what does that mean? If we have any graph, and maybe it looks like this, some kind of parabola. The average rate of change between any two points is the slope of the line through the two points. So I can find the slope of the lines here. Pretend that's a straight line, and that's one average rate of change, and I might find the slope of the line between these two points, and that's a different average rate of change. So it has to be dependent on any two points. That determines our particular average rate of change. So the interval matters. Let's look at an example. Find the average rate of change from x1 to x2 for the function f of x equals 3x plus 8 from 0 to 3. In order to find the average rate of change, I'm going to find the slope. To find the slope, I need the y values. So I find f of 3, 3 times 3 plus 8, which is 9 plus 8, or 17. f of 0 is 3 times 0 plus 8, which is 0 plus 8, or 8. My average rate of change, ROC, rate of change, is given by the slope f of 3 minus f of 0 over 3 minus 0. Notice this is a form of a difference quotient. That's 17 minus 8 over 3. Simplify the numerator, 9 over 3, which is 3. Now this is what I call a duh example. Average rate of change is the slope. This is a linear equation, linear function. A linear function will, this particular linear function will always have a slope of 3. The average rate of change will always be 3. I could take any interval. For a linear function, the average rate of change is the slope. So let's do an example that's a little more challenging. Let's find the average rate of change from 1 to 5 for the function g of x given by x squared minus 2x plus 8 from 1 to 5. So I'll find g of 5, which is 5 squared minus 2 times 5 plus 8, which is 25 minus 10 plus 8. That's 15 plus 8, which is 23. g of 1, 1 squared minus 2 times 1 plus 8, evaluating my function. 1 minus 2 plus 8, that's a negative 1 plus 8, which is 7. My average rate of change, g of 5 minus g of 1 over 5 minus 1. 23 minus 7 over 5 minus 1. I'll simplify my numerator, 23 minus 7, and get 16. I'll simplify my denominator, 5 minus 1, and get 4. 16 over 4 is 4. This is interval dependent. This is a quadratic function, so the average rate of change will de uh, change depending on which values we're given from the domain. Last one, find the average rate of change from 3 to 8 for our function h of x equals negative square root of x plus 1 plus 3. So first to find h of 8. I take 8 plus 1 under the radical, which gives me a 9. The square root of 9 is 3. Keep in mind the negative out in front of it. So I have a negative 3 and I have a plus 3 hanging off the end of the radical. Many times I'll put this little line at the end of a radical saying that's all that stays inside. In case I get a little sloppy with my writing, I remind myself the radical stops here. Negative 3 plus 3 is 0. Evaluate my function at 3, and I get the output of 1. The average rate of change, h of 8 minus h of 3, all over 8 minus 3, is 0 minus 1 over 8 minus 3. Negative 1 fifth leave it. You could call it a negative 0.2 if you want, but get used to fractions. A negative one-fifth is a fantastic answer.